So welcome everyone to Wednesday night at the lab. My name is Liz Jesse, and I'm a science outreach specialist at UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. On behalf of the Biotech Center, UW-Madison Division of Extension, right there in my shirt, uh, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, I would like to thank you for coming out to Wednesday night at the lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Kirchdorfer. Dr. Kirchdorfer is a faculty member in the Institute of Molecular Virology. Um, tonight, Dr. Kirchdorfer will share his research involving the molecular virology of coronaviruses. So I will go ahead with Tom's famous five questions, because I'm sure he'd be angry if I didn't. All right, are you prepared? I'm set, I'm ready. Okay. All right, so where were you born? I was born in Bismarck, North Dakota. Oh. It was a really cold night. I bet. <laughs> I think it's the only kind of night they have in Bismarck. Yeah, that's all I've heard about. It's always, it's always cold nights there, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and where did you go to high school? Uh, I graduated from high school in Oregon, Wisconsin, so just down the road. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay. Um, and where did you go for your undergrad? Uh, I'm a University of Wisconsin-Madison alum, so Excellent. I got my uh, bachelor's right here. Okay. And what did you study? I was a double major in genetics and biochemistry. Fantastic. Oh, this building is probably kind of important to you then. I took classes in this room. All like. right. Very cool. All right. Um, and then where did you go for your advanced degrees? Uh, I did my PhD and my postdocs out at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California, uh, where I studied the structural biology of influenza, Ebola, and coronaviruses. Oh, all the good stuff. All the good okay. ones. Ooh, good. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Robert Kirchdorfer. Thank you, Liz, and thank you guys for coming out. I know it's kind of a dreary night, um, but hopefully we have some exciting science uh, to, to lift us up. Um, before we get rolling on all the nuts and bolts of how coronaviruses infect cells and replicate their genomes, um, I need to put this up. I am a co-inventor on a patent. Um, it's entitled Prefusion Coronavirus Spikes, Proteins, and Their Uses. Um, and this specifically describes a couple of mutations um, in uh, coronavirus spikes. And we're going to get to why those mutations are important later, but I just wanted you guys to know that's there. Also, I'm a PhD. I've worked on coronaviruses. I've worked on a lot of other viruses. I've been doing this for years, but I'm not that kind of doctor. Um, so that nothing you should uh, take, you should not take anything uh, in this presentation as medical advice. You know, don't go make an important life-changing decision uh, without consulting a, a real medical doctor. All right, so tonight we're really gonna talk about uh, these three things. I'm gonna go over what is a coronavirus. Um, you know, we, we see this a lot in popular culture. People talk about the coronavirus. But I kind of want to go into what do we know about past coronaviruses, what do we know about the current coronavirus, and what do we know about the coronavirus family? What makes a virus a virus? Um, and then I'm going to go into two different aspects that my lab studies. The first is viral entry, so how do viruses get into cells and initiate a, an infection? And then once they're inside, how do they replicate their genomes? They make more copies of themselves. All right, so we're going to start with this kind of idea of what is a virus. And on the face of it, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. All right, and that means that they don't make their own energy, they can't copy their genomes, they can't make more of themselves, unless they go and infect a host cell. Um, so that's really what they are. Um, these genomes, you know, we usually think of, of genomes as being these double-stranded DNA genomes like you and I have, um, but it turns out that viruses are a lot more permissive in what they can have as a genome. The genome can be either DNA, or it could be a molecule called RNA that we'll talk about later. It could be double-stranded, like we typically think of DNA, or it could be single-stranded. So viruses uh, have all these different replication strategies depending on uh, what their genomes are. Viruses are everywhere. If there's an organism, there is a virus that infects it. That's everything from bacteria to plants to fungus to humans. Um, so no matter uh, what organism you're looking at, there's always going to be a virus that infects it. Some viruses are encased in a protein shell, and that's called a capsid. So this is adenovirus, and they have these kind of uh, soccer ball-shaped icosahedral capsids. They're beautiful and, and uh, very symmetric. Um, coronaviruses, however, are encased by a lipid membrane envelope. And so that you can kind of think of this as like a soap bubble. Um, it's roughly spherical, but it's not always spherical. There's some, some play in that shape. And that's made by lipids, so it's kind of like fat molecules as opposed to a protein molecule. Coronaviruses actually fall within this family tree, all right? So like I said, viruses can have lots of different types of genome. Over here on the left, we have DNA genomes. Here on the right, we have RNA genomes. 
Coronaviruses actually have single-stranded RNA genomes, all right? So that's really different than the genomes that you and I have. Um, within this family, this is actually a type of uh, RNA virus called a positive sense RNA virus. Um, and that just has to do whether it's the strand on the left or the strand on the right when you think about double-stranded DNA. Um, and so this is a positive strand. Um, we group viruses together by how they organize their genomes. And so coronaviruses actually fall within an order of viruses uh, called nidoviruses. And within this, coronaviruses form a subfamily, oops, am I doing this right? Oh, there we go, uh, called coronavirinae with four different genera, all right? So we think about genus and species. There's actually four genuses for coronaviruses. So when we think about the coronavirus, there is not the coronavirus. We have lots and lots of different coronaviruses. So like we said, coronaviruses have this lipid membrane that surrounds them. Um, within this lipid membrane is where they're going to carry their genomes. And this, again, is going to be that single-stranded RNA genome. Um, coronaviruses are unusual in how large that genome is. So you and I, we have genome, genome sizes on the order of billions of base pairs. Um, RNA viruses tend to go quite a bit smaller than that. Um, so coronaviruses actually have the largest RNA genome uh, at about 30,000 base pairs. Most RNA viruses are going to be more in like the 10 to 15 uh, kilobases range. Um, so coronaviruses are unusual in having a genome that large. The other thing that makes coronaviruses unusual is these really large spike proteins on the surface. So lots of different, pro or lots of different viruses are going to have these kind of spike proteins that are going to facilitate their entry into host cells. But on coronaviruses, these are unusually big. All right, so here's that coronavirus family tree, just shown a little bit way, shown in a little bit different of a way. Um, like I said, we have those four uh, genuses. We have the alpha coronaviruses, the beta coronaviruses, the delta coronaviruses, and the gamma coronaviruses. Now, here's three viruses that I'm sure everyone has heard of. We have the original SARS coronavirus that emerged in 2002. We have MERS coronavirus that emerged in 2012. And we have SARS-CoV-2 that emerged in 2019. All right, so I'm... Before we get to SARS-CoV-2, which I'm sure is on everybody's mind, I kind of want to go over some of these other viruses and what we learned from these past outbreaks and how that's helped us prepare uh, for the current outbreak. So the original SARS coronavirus emerged in 2002 in a province in China. Um, the World Health Organization was notified by the end of February of 2003. We had international spread. Um, this is a really good example of a super spreader event. So there were a relatively small number of cases in China um, and what happened was is a doctor who was treating uh, those cases went to Hong Kong, stayed in a hotel, um, and then it turns out that about a dozen people who shared his floor all came down with SARS and then flew back to their home countries with that. And so basically, within three or four months, we had international spread of SARS coronavirus. And this was before we really understood what a highly pathogenic coronavirus was. Where did SARS come from? Coronaviruses are endemic in bats. We find lots and lots of different beta coronaviruses in bats. Um, and it's thought that these uh, coronaviruses passed from bats into an intermediate species. And we're not entirely sure what that intermediate species was for SARS. These are some options. There's the Asian palm civet, uh, the raccoon dog, or the ferret badger. These are all represented at Asian live uh, wet markets. All right, So these are markets where live animals are sold, uh, usually for uh, consumption. Um, and these animals uh, passed the virus to humans. Now, it's thought that this probably, this jump from animals to humans probably only happened a few times. All right, so for the original SARS, we just have a few animal to human transmissions. Okay, so by the end of the SARS coronavirus pandemic, or SARS coronavirus outbreak, uh, SARS had spread to 27 countries. There were about 8,000 cases and 800 deaths. And when I gave this presentation, three years ago, that seemed, those seemed like big numbers. All right? um, however, because the number of cases was relatively small and the number of, or excuse me, the uh, symptoms from cases are, were easily identifiable, um, we could rapidly identify cases and quarantine both patients and their contacts. So this is really a public health solution to coronaviruses um, to reduce the spread of disease. And so in July of 2003, the outbreak was declared over. And SARS coronavirus didn't reappear in human circulation. All right, so that was an incredibly effective public health response to SARS coronavirus. In 2012, we had the emergence of MERS. And when this happened, there were initially a fairly small number of cases. Um, and then over the next several months, several more cases started appearing. 
Um, and most of these clustered around some kind of exposure to a Middle Eastern region. So somebody would spend time in the Middle East and maybe fly somewhere else. But all of the cases kind of originate um, in the Middle East. Um, this is usually a, a severe lower respiratory tract infection. Sometimes they have gastrointestinal symptoms, um, but that was a lot less common. Um, and it wasn't until November of 2012 that we knew that we had some kind of novel coronavirus. And MERS is very distinct from SARS, so uh, the, the methods to identify SARS didn't work for MERS. MERS is too different. So just like uh, SARS coronavirus, MERS coronavirus likely originated in a bat. And this virus then jumped into dromedary camels. So instead of all of those uh, Asian wet market uh, animals as our intermedi intermediate species, we have the dromedary camels. Um, and now MERS coronavirus is actually endemic in dromedary camels. You find this in camels not only in the Middle East, but also parts of Africa. And so what's, what, what winds up happening is the virus jumps from, hu from camels into humans, and then there's very limited human to human spread. Um, and so we haven't seen this really large MERS outbreak because it, uh, the MERS coronavirus doesn't spread efficiently from human to human. However, we have a lot more animal to human transmission. So we have an ongoing MERS outbreak that we haven't really talked about for the last couple of years because everybody's worried about the other coronavirus. But MERS continues to circulate. Okay, we're going to go through this quickly because we all just lived through this. <laughs> SARS coronavirus 2 and COVID-19. All right, so originally we identified that we had some kind of unknown respiratory disease, um, and it was reported to the World Health Organization. The genome was very rapidly sequenced, so China has an incredibly um, robust surveillance program for coronaviruses. Um, they developed this in response to the original SARS outbreak. Um, and finally, at the end of January, the World Health Organization declared this public health emergency. Um, at mid-February, mid uh, the, the disease was renamed COVID-19, so everybody remembers the early days when we called it novel coronavirus 2019. Now we go with COVID-19. Um, who finally declared the pandemic um, in March? And then mid-March, pretty much everything started shutting down, all right? And that's certainly when campus shut down and we all went to Zoom meetings. Um, so I do want to cover this, what's in a name? Um, we all refer to this as COVID-19. COVID-19 is not the name of the virus. The virus that's responsible for the global pandemic is actually SARS coronavirus 2. The disease that is caused by SARS coronavirus 2 is COVID-19. So we don't actually have COVID-19 vaccines. We actually have SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. But if I say that, nobody knows what I'm talking about. All right. So getting back to our family tree. These are our highly pathogenic human coronaviruses. It turns out there's a lot of other human coronaviruses out there. Um, and so some of these are beta coronaviruses, like OC43 or HKU1. Some of them are alpha coronaviruses, like the 229E or NL63. And these are typically really mild, these cause really mild disease. Um, so everybody's probably had one of these. Um, it's generally more mild than the flu. Nobody really dies of these. Um, some uh, cases of NL63 do infect kids, and that can be a more serious infection. Um, but by and large, these just make up into that kind of large bolus of common cold viruses that we have every winter. On top of that, there's a whole bunch of animal coronaviruses. Um, and some of these are agriculturally important. Um, so transmissible gastroenteritis virus, porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, you definitely don't want that one. Uh, porcine delta coronavirus, these all infect pigs. Um, and they're uh, close to 100% lethal in unweaned piglets. Um, so these really rip through uh, uh, pig farms. Um, there's also turkey coronavirus and infectious bronchitis virus. Um, IBV is actually a, a chicken virus um, and can be 100% fatal to uh, newly hatched chicks. Um, so that's a really big problem in hen houses. Um, it also causes problems with uh, egg laying um, and uh, development of, of the chicks. Okay, so now I want to get into what my lab works on, and so I, you know, hopefully I've impressed upon you how important all of this research is. Um, and we're really going to focus on these two aspects. So this is how a virus works, right? So a virus is going to approach a cell. It's got to enter that cell, deliver its genome to the inside of the cell. That genome is, then needs to be expressed. The genome needs to be replicated. We need more copies of that genome. Then we need to make all of the structural proteins. Those are the proteins that are going to go into making new viruses. And those viruses need to assemble and bud and then get released. And my lab really works on two aspects of this process. The first is this entry step. And the second is this replication step. So we're going to start with entry, and hopefully we have time to get to uh, replication. Okay, so 
we really ask the question, how do coronaviruses enter cells? We have this virus, it's hanging out, it's you know, either floating through your blood or floating through um, some kind of extracellular space, and it needs to do a couple things to get inside a cell. The first is that it needs to bind host receptors. So your cells are covered with proteins, they're covered with sugars, they're covered with lipids, and all of those are potential uh, handles for the virus to latch onto and initiate entry. The second thing that these viruses need to do is because they have a lipid envelope and you have a lipid membrane around your cells, is they need to fuse those two membranes together. So they're going to fuse this lipid envelope from the virus with the host cell membrane, and this is going to create a pore through which the viral genome can then enter the cell. To do all of these things, coronaviruses use a protein called spike, and you've probably heard of spike because this is what's in all of your coronavirus vaccines. Um, coronavirus, or spike is responsible for binding to host receptors and for fusing the, uh, the viral and host cell membranes together. It's also the major uh, protein on the surface of the virus, which means it's a great target for host antibodies. Now, how do we study this? We use a technique called structural biology. And what this is is high-resolution imaging to really determine the structure and organization of biological ma macromolecules. So in this context, what does high-resolution mean? The high-resolution imaging that we're doing, we're really looking at atomic structure, all right? So I want to see where every atom in this protein winds up. So we know the exact chemistry, we know the shape, we know all the binding pockets, we know uh, potential uh, partners um, for how these proteins work, all right? So this is really getting at what is the structure of a protein and how does that impart function on the protein. This also brings up an important question of what is a protein? We usually think of proteins as dietary protein. You know, did I get enough protein in my diet today? And that's true, but what do you need that protein for, right? So you ate a bunch of protein, what does your body do with it? Your body uses that protein, breaks it down into uh, monomers called amino acids, and those are used to build up your own proteins. So there's 20 different types of amino acids, and uh, these all have a unique type of chemistry. All right, so when we use these in proteins, different amino acids are going to give different types of chemistry to that protein. To make proteins, we string these amino acids together into chains, all right? And so this is a linear chain of amino acids. Um, I think there's eight amino acids here. Most proteins you're going to look at are probably going to be hundreds of amino acids long. And this means that not only do we have distinct chemistry, but these, pro these proteins then have the opportunity to fold into distinct shapes. And it's those shapes and that chemistry that's going to give the protein its function. So here's an example um, of some ways that we represent uh, proteins. So again, these amino acids that are bonded together form proteins. Um, and these proteins can fold into special shapes. Here are some common shapes that we see in proteins. Um, if we line up all of our chains, uh, so like this one would go off and then come back and then go off and then come back, um, we call that a beta sheet. Um, on the right, we have what is essentially a, a helix of amino acids going up. Um, and so this, these are very uh, prevalent forms of, of protein folds. Um, a simplified way to look at this is to either you know, swap out this representation with this one. They're equivalent. So I'm going to show you a lot of things that have these strands and a lot of things that have these helices. Um, those are easier ways of looking at protein structure, but I want you to remember that really what we're looking at is these atomic representations, right? So this is a different way to represent this. Um, so how do we actually do this? And so, like I said, we use high-resolution imaging. Why? And this brings me to this quote by Richard Feynman that I just love, that we can answer so many interesting biological questions just by looking at what we're interested in. All right, and so how do we do this? Um, so if you're looking at a cell, you might use a light microscope, but we're looking at single proteins. And so we use really impressive giant electron microscopes. Um, the way that this works is we take a very highly purified protein solution and we freeze it onto these itty bitty copper grids. All right, and we free this, freeze this into a thin film. We put these uh, grids um, into these electron microscopes. And this is a picture of an electron microscope that's actually across the street. This microscope's about 12 feet tall. Um, and what we get is images like this one, all right? So for everybody who's squinting in the back, trying to see what's on this image, it is a dark, it's dark gray specks on a light gray background, all right? That's what proteins look like in an electron microscope. So every dark gray speck on there is a single protein molecule. And we, what we can do is to take each and every single one of these particles and we average them together. And what we can do is reconstruct a three-dimensional volume 
of what that protein looks like. So what does that really mean? Um, so we're really determining what's called a density map. Um, and if we're at really high resolution, so this is resolutions uh, down in the angstrom range, um, we can build an atomic model into that density. So like I said, um, we're building helices. I don't think there's any sheets in this particular view. Um, but this is, this is all a representation of the structure and the chemistry of that protein. All right. So the first thing that we did was to apply this to coronavirus spikes. And the coronavirus spike that we started with was uh, a spike from a coronavirus called HKU1, which is one of those common cold beta coronaviruses. So here's the spike in, uh, in ice. This is uh, a frozen spike. Um, and when we reconstruct it, we get something that looks like this. All right? So this is an atomic model of a coronavirus spike. And this was the first coronavirus spike structure ever determined. If we look just up at the top of this spike, it turns out this is all, these are all the sites where coronaviruses are known to latch on to host cells. So we call these receptor binding sites. Coronaviruses actually have two different sites on their spikes that they're able to bind to receptors. The first is here on the N-terminal domain, and the second one is here on the C-terminal domain. Now, this one on the N-terminal domain, that's pretty well accessible, right? So it's, that can just reach up and grab something. The one on the C-terminal domain, that's actually probably more problematic. So if we look uh, at our atomic model, um, so these are our three C-terminal domains that I just lifted out of the last slide. Um, this yellow region is the part that binds to host receptors. But you can see that this region is packed against this one, and this region is packed against this one. So how do we expose those sites so that they can actually grab receptors? Um, so we knew from previous studies of SARS coronavirus and MERS coronavirus that these domains bound to their receptors using these sites. So this is the receptor for SARS coronavirus, ACE2, and this is uh, the receptor for MERS coronavirus, DPP4. So what did we do? We used electron microscopy to determine the structure of SARS coronavirus spike. So this is what it looks like. This looks a lot like HKU1. One of the powers of cryo-electron microscopy is that we can actually pull multiple structures out of a single data set. So, uh, we actually pulled out structures where these C-terminal domains move. Um, so now instead of just this kind of downwards confirmation, we can also pull out confirmations where these C-terminal domains have transitioned to an upwards confirmation. And this is exposing these receptor binding sites so that now they can grab receptors. We're going to let this play because I love molecular movies. <laughs> All right. So after we determined this for SARS coronavirus, uh, we said, well, what does it look like when receptors actually bound? And lo and behold, if we take the ACE2 receptor and we bind it to our coronavirus spikes, uh, the ACE2 receptor binds to a C-terminal domain that's in that upwards conformation. All right. So beta coronaviruses aren't the only coronaviruses out there. We work on several. Um, so I want to tell you a short story about porcine epidemic diarrhea virus. And you can tell by the name this is not a virus that you want in your household. Um, this is an alpha coronavirus, so it's, again, it's on the other side of the family tree from the, the SARS and the MERS-like viruses. Um, this infects pigs, particularly the gastrointestinal tracts of pigs, and causes a severe diarrhea. Um, this is generally lethal to unweaned piglets um, and can cause severe disease in, adults, in adult pigs. Um, so again, we use cryo-electron microscopy to determine the structure of this spike. Uh, this, this spike looks a little bit bigger. Uh, than the spikes of beta coronaviruses because the alpha coronaviruses, a lot of them have an extra domain. Um, so this is the extra domain on alphas. And we could use this map to determine this atomic model of the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus spike. Now, why were we interested in this? We really wanted to look at immune responses to coronaviruses. Um, and so uh, to do this, we're going to need antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that your body produces in response to an infection to bind up foreign material. Um, antibodies are highly specific, so antibodies uh, are typically depicted as this kind of Y-shaped protein. Um, and it's these ends, these arms of the Y, that are really reaching out and grabbing what they're interested in binding. Um, so here's our coronavirus, and this is a, a watercolor by David Goodsell. I love David Goodsell paintings. I've got them all over the walls of my lab. Um, and here's an antibody uh, stuck to that spike. All right, so this is how antibodies are going to recognize those spike proteins. But we're really interested in looking at this with structural biology, not just an artistic rendition uh, in beautiful watercolor. Um, and so to do this, we use a technique uh, to essentially look at the whole population of antibodies in a blood sample. 
Um, and so we collaborated uh, with a, a scientist at Iowa State University who experimentally infected pigs, isolated the antibodies that were produced. We took those antibodies, bound them to our spike protein, and then uh, re, uh, re-isolated the spikes. We get rid of most of the stuff that didn't bind. So here's what porcine epidemic diarrhea virus spikes looks like at low resolution. Um, so it's just kind of this blob. We can put our uh, atomic model into that density. And this is where antibodies bind. So this is where those arms of the Y uh, come down and contact this. And so this is the first pig that we looked at. Now it turns out we actually looked at three pigs. And all three pigs make antibodies that bind in the same spots. And what this says is that these spots are immunodominant. That the, uh, the way that these spikes are presented to the immune system means that these antibodies always get raised in response to this infection. Okay, so we talked about coronavirus spike, we talked about host receptors and antibodies. What about this fusion thing? Um, So as I mentioned, coronavirus spikes have uh, uh, fusion proteins, and these are the largest class one viral fusion proteins known. So we find class one viral fusion proteins in other viruses, like uh, influenza, HIV, Ebola, Nipah virus, respiratory syncytial virus, Um, but coronavirus spikes are by far the biggest. Um, So they have extra receptor binding domains, they have extra protease cleavage sites, uh, their fusion machinery is bigger, they're just all around huge. Um, And so this is, I'm gonna walk you through a model of how we think fusion works. Um, We start with our spike protein on the surface, it gets clipped by a host enzyme into two different subunits. We have our receptor binding subunits here on top and our fusion mediating uh, subunits on the bottom in green. Um, Now this is gonna bind to a receptor, and again, in the case of SARS coronavirus and SARS-2, this is the ACE2 receptor. Uh, And this is gonna expose another site on the spike that's gonna get clipped again uh, by a different host enzyme. And this is gonna free up this uh, membrane insertion region in the spike. Now spike is gonna refold from this prefusion form to this, what we call a pre-hairpin intermediate. Uh, where it inserts this uh, kind of floppy bit into the host cell membrane, right? So it's now flipped out and grabbed the host cell membrane. And then in a second conformational change, it's gonna bring the host cell membrane and the viral membranes together, and that's gonna cause fusion, right? So we're going from this kind of free-floating state to this fused state. Now, to get through this process, spike has to refold, right? We talked a little bit about refolding at the beginning, Um, and so, uh, we're going from this pre-fusion state to this post-fusion state. So all of the blue bits, those get removed during this process. But you, I want you to notice how the orange and, uh, and gray bits completely change their shape. All right, so this is a really cool movie uh, from uh, Janet Iwasa. She's a, a re- uh, an animator at the University of Utah. Um, and so here we have our spike proteins on the surface. Um, inside we have our viral genomes and they're coded in a protein called nucleocapsid. And then this virus is gonna go find uh, a host cell. So this is the surface of our host cell down on the bottom. Uh, We have ACE2 in purple, and all of these enzymes that are going to cleave our spikes um, in in yellow and orange. So there's the spike coming down. It finds its ACE2 receptors. Those C-terminal domains are opening up to grab those ACE2 molecules. Once all of those uh, C-terminal domains have engaged uh, the receptor, the uh, receptor binding regions, these kind of regions that are uh, down here, are going to leave, all right? So they're going to uh, get removed. And this is, in, this is facilitated by this uh, protease cleavage, right? So we're clipping the protein to remove those regions. Once those are clipped, we're gonna do our first refolding of the viral spike protein. And this is gonna insert into the target host, target host membrane. And then in that second conformational change, this is gonna refold Uh, to actually fuse the viral and host membranes together. I love molecular animations, so cool. All right, so why do we wanna talk about this? So spikes are inherently unstable, right? They need to undergo these large conformational changes, and once they do, those conformational changes are more or less irreversible. Um, And so that's a problem when we wanna work with spikes either in the lab or as a vaccine platform. Uh, Because when we prep pre-fusion spike, a lot of it, transitions to post-fusion, all right? So uh, this is just, uh, if I pop a a sample in the electron microscope and we take what are called 2D class averages where I just average um, a bunch of uh, particles together, Uh, we have pre-fusion particles, but we also have a lot of post-fusion particles. 
The reason why we care about that is because the antibody response to these two different shapes of proteins are really different. If we make antibodies against the post-fusion form, those antibodies tend not to neutralize the virus. So what we really want to do is make antibodies against the pre-fusion form, because those are the effective antibodies that are going to prevent infection. So this transition to the post-fusion form is, is a problem not only for the SARS that I just mentioned, but also for MERS coronavirus. Luckily, HKU1, that original structure that we solved, doesn't have this problem. Um, to overcome this, uh, our collaborators, Nishang Wang and Jason McClellan, uh, designed two mutations in coronavirus spike proteins. And so these are mutations that we can add in the lab or we can add in a vaccine platform. Uh, and it's two proline mutations at the top of this helix kind of buried within the spike. And the idea is that this, these two proline mutations are going to prevent this first shape change. All right, so to antibodies, these spikes look exactly the same. But the hope is that we maintain this in the pre-fusion confirmation. And that's exactly what this does. This is remarkably elegant. Um, and so here we have our wild type spikes, and over here we have our, our proline mutated spikes. And you see how we lose all of that post-fusion form. And so now uh, this uh, has the potential to be a better vaccine candidate. And it turns out that spikes with these proline mutations elicit better antibodies than the wild type spikes. Um, the reason why I put that disclaimer up at the beginning, these proline mutations, or sometimes called the 2P mutations, have been incorporated into a lot of vaccine platforms. That includes the current Moderna, Pfizer, J&J, &J, uh, and another platform called Novavax, which is approved in Europe, um, to improve the antibody responses in COVID vaccines. All right, so if you've received your mRNA shot or you've gotten your J&J &J shot, uh, you have these stabilized spikes, uh, or you made antibodies to these stabilized spikes. OK, so we talked about entry. What happens after entry, right? So we fused our viral membranes with our host membranes, and now we're ready to go releasing our genome into a cell, ready to start infection. Um, so that genome's going to get released into the cytoplasm. Um, but we should probably talk about what that genome is. So normally, when we think about genomes, we think about DNA, double-stranded DNA. But it actually turns out that coronaviruses, or, or rather your host cells, have another way of encoding information called RNA, which I hope is going to show up here in just a second. There it is. All right, so again, this is just a sequence of bases. And this is chemically very similar to DNA. There are some differences. Um, so if we think about uh, how this works, uh, DNA is really the master blueprint of your cells. In your cells, RNA is more like an inner office memo that gets copied off that master blueprint and then gets taken to somebody who's actually going to read it and do something with it. The only difference between DNA and RNA is this one little oxygen down here. But that makes all the difference in the world for how these molecules get used. All right. One of the uses of DNA, you know, we say DNA uh, encodes uh, all the information of who you are. Um, well, our, one of the functions of DNA is to be copied into RNA, and that RNA is used to direct the synthesis of particular proteins. To do this, either the copying of, of DNA into RNA or making proteins requires host cell machinery. Um, and so for copying uh, nucleic acid, we call those polymerases. For making protein, we call those ribosome, ribosomes. So this leads us to the central dogma of molecular biology. So we have DNA every time one of your cells uh, replicates. It has to replicate its DNA. Um, that DNA can be copied into RNA, and that RNA makes protein. But there are some problems. One, coronaviruses don't have DNA. They have RNA genomes. So this actually provides a couple of uh, changes to how coronaviruses use host cell machinery. Uh, the first, this RNA genome can be made directly into proteins. So we don't have to copy the genome to make proteins. As soon as that genome hits the cytoplasm, we can start making proteins off of it. The other thing is, rather than replicating DNA, which we don't have, we need a way to replicate RNA, which is not something that the host cell usually does. And so coronaviruses and all RNA viruses um, have a special polymerase to do this RNA-directed copying. OK, so here we have a host ribosome. It's reading uh, this uh, viral genome, and it's producing uh, these viral proteins. The, the viral proteins that get produced, it's called a long polyprotein. And after that polyprotein is synthesized, it gets chopped into smaller functional subunits by a viral enzyme called a protease. 
One of the really important proteins uh, that this uh, winds up making is a polymerase protein. All right, and so polymerase is the protein that's gonna do this copying step. Now, when we jumped into this field, uh, we knew a lot about coronavirus RNA synthesis. We had helicases, we had methyltransferases, we had cofactors, but we had one glaring uh, missing uh, sort of protein in our tableau of, of structures, and that was the actual polymerase that does all of the copying. So the copying is done by a, a coronavirus uh, protein called NSP12, and this is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That means that it uses an RNA template and produces an RNA product. Uh, now, this polymerase isn't active on its own. It actually needs two cofactors, which are viral proteins, and they're the NSP7 and NSP8 proteins. So again, we used uh, structural biology and single particle cryoelectron microscopy to determine the structure of this protein. So here's our map. The first thing we did was dock in some known structures into this map. So there's a polymerase, there's some cofactors, and then we start going through the map and we start looking for features that we recognize, alpha helices, beta sheets, uh, sequence motifs. Uh, and then we start linking all of this up to, to really build out the structure and figure out what this molecule looks like. All right, keep going. It's doing great. This took me long, way, way longer to build. All right, so that, that's how we solve the structure of the first uh, coronavirus polymerase. All right, and this was SARS coronavirus. Uh, this was published in 2019 before the pandemic. Um, we can compare this uh, coronavirus polymerase to other viral polymerases, in particular uh, polio virus and dengue virus. And, the, and all polymerases, be they viral polymerases or the polymerases that replicate your DNA and RNA, um, have this kind of shared architecture. Um, so if you want to follow along, uh, they have a cupped right hand uh, architecture with a fingers, thumb, and palm subdomain. Uh, template, so the stuff that you're going to copy, uh, kind of comes down from the top. The active site is at the base of the thumb. And then the product is going to come out uh, kind of towards, I don't know, the heel of your hand. All right. We can also look at the surface properties of these enzymes. Um, and so this is an electrostatic representation. So what's the surface charge of the protein? So there's positively charged amino acids and there's negatively charged amino acids. Uh, looking at this, we have this large positively charged cleft in the polymerase, and this is a good binding site for RNA, which is naturally negatively charged, so positives and negatives attract. Um, we can also look at sequence conservation. So we look across the coronavirus family and say, how often is that position the same? How often is it different? And so uh, the active site of polymerase, the RNA binding sites of polymerase are all very well conserved. Um, spinning this around, uh, we also have a conserved site on the kind of the back side of the polymerase active site, and that's where uh, the substrates uh, for polymerization are going to be bound. Okay. So uh, here we have our NSP12, uh, NSP78 polymerase structure, and this is going to be this protein that copies the RNA for viral replication. Now, when we solved our structure, it didn't have anything in it. We didn't give it substrate. But looking at other polymerases and other polymerase structures that have already been done, we could hypothesize about how RNA was going to bind in this active site. Um, so again, that template's going to kind of come down from the top. Uh, the subs the, the uh, incoming substrates, the nucleotide triphosphates, which are actually what get uh, incorporated, uh, come in from the back, and then product comes out from the front. So that's great. We found out that the coronavirus polymerase looks like a polymerase. Um, but we learned a lot of other things that we didn't expect to see from this structure. First is that coronavirus polymerases bind zinc. Um, and so we have these two zinc binding sites within the coronavirus polymerase. Um, these are both coordinated by conserved amino acids. So these eight amino acids that are uh, coordinating these two zinc ions, so this is our zinc, um, are absolutely conserved across every coronavirus that we know of. The other unexpected thing that we, uh, that we saw, so I mentioned that we need NSP7 and NSP8 cofactors for an active polymerase. Um, and so here's our NSP7 and NSP8, that's great but it turns out we actually have density for a second copy of NSP8. And so we have a, an unexpected uh, uh, stoichiometry. So we can add this polymerase to our tableau of different proteins. Um, and now we can start to ask questions about how these proteins might interact with one another to carry out viral replication. One of the things that we, uh, uh, that we struggled with uh, were disordered parts of the protein. So cryoelectron microscopy is averaging together thousands, tens of thousands of particles. And so if we have part of the protein that moves, well, when we average all those particles together, that motion just blurs out the density. So we can't interpret those regions. 
We're missing regions in NSP8 that are fairly long, about 80 amino acids. And so one of the things we hypothesized is maybe these bits of NSP8 that are moving in our structure might be reaching out and grabbing other cofactors. All right, so I've been telling you about our work, but now I kind of want to transition a little bit and tell you about how things have evolved since the start of the pandemic. And this is really a global scientific effort from uh, scientists uh, on different continents. Um, so first, SARS coronavirus 2 polymerase has 96% sequence identity with SARS coronavirus. So when we compare the two polymerases, structurally, they are nearly identical. Um, and so the first structures that came out looked exactly like our original structure. When we finally got some structures that had bound RNA, this RNA binds exactly like we had hypothesized it would based on our first models. Things start to get really interesting, though, when longer RNAs get included. So not only do we see the longer RNA, but now these N-terminal regions of NSP8 become ordered. And it turns out that these bind the downstream RNA. All right, and this was hypothesized to improve the ability of polymerase to hang on to that RNA and replicate for longer. These NSP8s are also binding sites for a protein called NSP13, that's an RNA helicase. Um, and this helicase is thought to be important for kind of regulating how template interacts with the polymerase active site, so how it comes in and out. Okay. So I kind of want to finish with these ideas of replication uh, fidelity and mutagenesis, because this is really important as we think about how uh, coronaviruses change over time. Um, and so unlike the DNA replication in your cells, which is incredibly faithful, you rarely make uh, changes or mutations in your genomes when your cells replicate. Viruses are really sloppy. They make changes all the time. It turns out that coronaviruses have a way to remove those errors as they occur, which improves the, rep the fidelity of replication. So polymerase is going along, it makes a mistake, and then they have a mechanism to kick those errors out and then continue uh, replicating. This is really important when we consider uh, a class of drugs called nucleoside analogs. Um, now, the reason why we want to uh, target drugs to the coronavirus polymerase is because that replication of RNA is not something that your host cells have. Your cells want to replicate DNA, they want to copy, copy DNA into RNA, but they don't really ever have a reason to copy RNA into more RNA. And that makes that a unique target that we can hit with drugs. So there is a popular class of drugs, and these re resemble nucleosides, which is why these are nucleoside analogs. Um, and nucleosides are the natural building blocks of RNA. So over here we have our natural nucleosides, so adenosine, guanosine, and uridine. Um, and then the nucleoside analogs, things like remdesivir, uh, ribavirin, and 5-fluorouridine. All right, so these are things that look like nucleotide an nucleoside analogs, but are a little bit different. When these things encounter a uh, viral polymerase, they can be used in place of the natural nucleotide. And this can have a couple of effects on that polymerase. It can cause the polymerase to slow or even stop completely, or it can cause a mutation in the virus genome. And so these are some of the ways that current drugs work against RNA viruses. Now, one of the challenges for drug development for coronaviruses, particularly for nucleoside analogs, um, I had mentioned to you that we have this uh, proofreading activity. This is carried out by a protein called NSP14 to remove errors that occur during replication. Well, it turns out that NSP14 also removes incorporated nucleoside analogs. It reads those analogs as mismatches, as errors during replication, and it edits them back out. And this means that coronaviruses are actually naturally resistant to most nucleoside analog drugs. And that's one of the challenges in developing these. So things like remdesivir or molnupiravir, which are the approved coronavirus therapeutics, are really amazing feats of scientific uh, achievement because it overcomes this proofreading effect. How this proofreading works, we don't entirely know yet. This is an active area of investigation. I have a graduate student who works very long nights on this. Um, we're trying to figure out how polymerase, which is actually doing the copying and making the errors, talks to this proofreading enzyme. So there's got to be some kind of coordination between the two, uh, and we're working out how that might, uh, that might work. Um, the thought is, is that if we can figure out how proofreading works, how mismatches are sensed or how they're edited, that we could make a better antiviral drug because then it would evade that proofreading mechanism. All of this is really important when we start to consider things like variants. All right, so what is a variant? Um, viruses are going to make mistakes during replication. Even with proofreading, coronaviruses make lots of mistakes. 
When we make mistakes, that leads to mutations in the virus genome. Um, most of these mutations are either going to be neutral, so they're not going to do anything, or they're going to be deleterious to the virus, so it's going to hurt the virus. Rarely, that's going to be an advantage for the virus. Um, and when you're making millions upon millions upon millions of virions, you only have to get it right once. Um, so some ways that mutations can, make a, can be more advantageous, advantageous for the virus um, is to change the virus to infect more people. Um, and so that's increasing the transmissibility of the virus. So that's changing uh, how the spike might interact with host receptors. Um, and they can also change how the, the virus interacts with the host immune response, particularly the antibody response. Um, so a virus could mutate to escape existing immunity. So that's antibody evasion. So here's a, an image of the Omicron spike. Um, so the, the jump from Delta to Omicron uh, is probably the largest mutational jump that we've seen for coronaviruses or the SARS-CoV-2 so far. There's about 50 mutations in the genome. 30 of those mutations are in, in the spike. Um, and so all of these purple dots is a mutation in the virus spike. Um, you find these all over, but you find them especially clustered up at the top um, in that domain that binds to receptor. This is also a major binding site for antibodies. And so these mutations are likely both increasing transmissibility and improving uh, antibody evasion. So just kind of, wrap, just kind of to uh, wrap up, I hope I have convinced you that uh, the basic research that people have been doing for close to 20 years now in the wakes of SARS and uh, MERS have really helped us prepare for SARS-CoV-2. You know, within a year of, of SARS-CoV-2 emerging, we had vaccines and we had antiviral drugs, which is unheard of. Um, we talked about viral spikes and their structures, um, how they interact with receptors and how they interact with antibodies, um, and how we can stabilize those spikes to make better coronavirus vaccines. Uh, and then we finished talking about coronavirus polymerases and how they might interact with other cofactors uh, to maybe uh, teach us how to design better antiviral drugs. I just want to wrap up by acknowledging some people who helped uh, quite a bit. Um, so a lot of this work I did before I got to the UW in 2019 uh, with Andrew Ward at the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, the uh, antibodies uh, for the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus uh, were provided uh, by Kyung Jin Yoon um, at Iowa State. And then I'm funded uh, by the National Institutes for Allergy and Infectious Disease. Um, so that's all I've got, and I would be happy to take any questions that you have. Yeah. We are not yet. Uh, it turns out that viral sequences tend to be a bit more of a challenge. Um, the other challenge, so this is, this is AlphaFold, is the, the program that does this. And basically what it allows you to do is predict a protein structure from its sequence. Um, it seems that that's a fairly accurate way to go. It, it seems that most structures recapitulate what, what AlphaFold suggests. Um, AlphaFold is not so good yet at looking at protein-protein interactions, uh, interactions with substrates. Um, and so we still have a lot to learn from more of an experimental side. Um, we can predict some novel structures that way, um, but it's certainly not going to give us the whole story. Yeah? To, to relate, but it's species specificity for the coronaviruses, but is that just the entry and therefore the receptor and the structure of protein? And then the second related question is how many pigs did you have? Are they related or are they <laughs> Yeah. Um, so species specificity. Every coronavirus infects more or less a different species. Uh, coronaviruses are notorious species jumpers. Um, they are really good at things like recombination, and so you have recombination between different coronaviruses, which can extend, uh, extend tropism uh, for, for virus uh, infection. Um, what else can I tell you about that? There's a lot of things that control tropism. Uh, so certainly the receptor that you use is a, a fairly large uh, barrier to species jumping. Um, there are others. Uh, so we didn't go into it in a lot of detail, but I mentioned that we have a lot of enzymes that cleave the viral spike protein. Depending on uh, where those enzymes are expressed changes what cells coronaviruses can infect, infect efficiently. In addition to the, the proteins involved in replication and the, the proteins involved in making new viruses, Coronaviruses also have a set of accessory proteins, and we, I didn't mention those at all, because every coronavirus has a different set of accessory proteins. Um, those are often involved in interacting with uh, some kind of immune response. Uh, 
Um, and usually those are where you see a lot of the first adaptive changes upon a species jump. Um, so there are a, a lot of different ways that you can adapt to coronavirus or a lot of things that need to change uh, before a coronavirus can, can jump species. Uh, and your second question was? Yeah. Oh, right. Um, I believe that those were uh, outbred pigs. Yeah. I'm not a scientist, so excuse my naivety. You talked about um, clipping that initiates the transition from the pre to the post -medium. Is there a strategy to stop clipping? Uh, so there, there, it's been suggested. Uh, so, so there's been some suggestions that we should be treating people with, they're, they're called protease inhibitors. Um, I've not seen a lot of good clinical data on that so far as to whether or not that's actually an effective way. Um, you're actually inhibiting a host protein in that case, um, which can be problematic, problematic for toxicity regions. Um, sometimes you can get around that, but sometimes it's not so good. Yeah. Um, I think that it's almost certainly a bat origin. Um, whether or not that jumped into an intermediate species first, I think is still up for debate. Um, if, if you're referring to the lab leak hypothesis, there's no data to support that. Um, I think people are leaving it on the table as well. I guess it's possible. Um, but, but certainly, coronaviruses, SARS like coronaviruses, and so SARS 2 like coronaviruses, have been circulating in bats for decades. Um, and so, uh, you know, just because you can't find the exact coronavirus in a bat species doesn't mean that it's not in there. Uh, so, for example, uh, before the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2, uh, somebody went into a single cave, surveyed all of the, the bats that they could find, um, and looked at the SARS-like coronaviruses in those bats. And you can find regions that are identical to the, the original SARS coronavirus. Um, and so, basically, you have the entire SARS coronavirus genome diversity within a single cave of bats. Now, the virus, SARS coronavirus, wasn't isolated from those bats, but parts of it were. So there's lots of related SARS coronaviruses already circulating in bats. They've been there for decades. Um, again, whether it jumped into an intermediate species, it seems likely that it did, but we have no idea what that intermediate species might have been. Yeah. Um, so, really, this is because bats are hosts for a lot of really awful things. Um, and really, this is because bats and their parasites have learned to live together. Um, so really, where you see highly pathogenic disease is where you have some kind of disequilibrium, uh, where a virus jumps into a new species. Um, so the same can actually be said for Ebola. So Ebola circulates in bats, or we believe that it does, but appears not to cause serious disease. But it, if it jumps into primates, or humans, uh, then it's incredibly lethal. And again, that, I think that's because of a, a poor adaptation between host um, and, and virus. Um, it's not advantageous for a parasite to kill its host. Um, it's probably not the case that bats have this, you know, silver bullet immune system, uh, but rather that they've just tailored, their, the, the virus has tailored its response uh, to the bats. Yeah. Uh, with regard to Ebola, how much of the problem is due to the fact Um, so Ebola is actually spread by bats. Uh, so it's not so much uh, a problem for destruction of primate habitat. It has more to do with people uh, uh, using bats for bushmeat. Um, and so that's a, a source of protein in, in Africa. Um, and so yeah, that's certainly going into wild, wild areas, you're going to expose yourself to pathogens that you've never seen before. Um, and that sort of that bush meat practice is w encourages the transmission of things like Ebola. Yeah. Another question. Um, given the experience with Ebola and uh, COVID-19, uh, is it virtually impossible to quarantine these diseases today with uh, the advent of rapid transportation and communication? 
I mean, so it, it becomes a virtually impossible proposition, doesn't it? So it depends on when you catch the outbreak. Um, if you catch an outbreak and it's, you already have several thousand cases, you're really going to struggle to identify and isolate all of those cases. It also depends on uh, how severe disease that, that, that virus causes. Uh, so if, you, if every person that gets infected manifests disease, those people are relatively easy to identify. When you start to have asymptomatic cases, and those asymptomatic cases can then pass it on to someone else who becomes symptomatic, then it's much harder to isolate and identify uh, the, the infected cases. So it depends a lot on the particular virus um, in terms of how fast it moves uh, between people. Um, and how fast you see disease. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the timing of, of when it, the, this disease appeared, I've been a little bit wondering about trying to come up with a time when it appeared, because my, my, my sense is it's been evolving all this time for maybe for 30 years, and it finally got to the point where people got sick enough and enough of them got sick so it became a pandemic. There's not a cutoff point here that right. so, so before and now it does. Yeah, so we don't know when the first human transmission was, uh, which I would probably say is the, the introduction of the virus into human circulation. Um, my impression of it is that every time a virus mutates, it's rolling the dice. Um, and if that virus comes up human, uh, and if it sees a human that it can infect, then that could be a possible animal to human uh, transmission. Now, as I said, most mutations are going to be deleterious. They're not going to be good for the virus. Um, and so the virus is going to have to roll that dice a lot. And then you're going to have to expose that particular virus into humans. So whether it was, I, I don't believe that the virus was evolving in humans for 20 years. It's more likely that it was evolving in bats. Uh, or, or an intermediate species for several years, and then was able to jump into humans once or twice, and then begin to adapt to humans. Um, so, so yes, it's it's a long process, but it's viruses actually adapt pretty quickly, um, and you're more likely to have undergone that evolution, that ad, not necessarily an adaptation, but the diversification um, of of that pre-species in in whatever reservoir uh, SARS-CoV-2 came from. Yeah. In your opinion, are we turning the corner with the COVID-19, or is there a lot more to come? Oh, uh, ooh, that is an epidemiological question. I am not an epidemiologist. Um, I don't know, is the short answer. Uh, I had really hoped we were done after Delta, and then we had Omicron. Uh, now we have BA2 coming out, and I'm sure they'll come up with some fancy Greek letter for that if they haven't already. Um, I don't think that COVID is, is ever going to go away. Um, at this point, we, we're not facing a situation like we had for the original SARS, where we had a limited number of cases that we could isolate all of them and really shut it down. Um, I would strongly suspect that SARS coronavirus 2 will circulate more or less indefinitely and hopefully kind of evolve itself into one of the less pathogenic common cold viruses. Um, how long that would take, I don't really know, but I, I suspect that that's the direction that it would head. Yeah. So you talked about the spikes they change their shape. Where, where, where does protein get the energy to change its shape? Sure. So spikes are expressed as a metastable form, so they're already unstable. Uh, they want to undergo that shape change. Um, and it's really those receptor binding regions uh, that, that sit on top that prevent that, sh that shape change. So it can't undergo the shape change until the protein is fully folded. Um, and that, that those capping proteins and the lack of the proteolytic cleavage events uh, prevent the premature change. Now, having said that, you can still get spontaneous change. So if you look in a lot of the early electron micrographs, uh, which is how they used to diagnose uh, coronaviruses, um, most of the spikes are in a post-fusion form. So certainly, you can still undergo these conformational changes without binding receptors, without being cleaved by proteases. That's probably not a productive fusion event. Um, but the, it's the refolding itself uh, that is providing energy for, for fusion. Yeah? I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the fact, which is generally not known, is that the Rocky Mountains, and particularly the southwest U.S., are considered to be permanent reservoirs for the potential spread 
of bubonic plague and other, other nice things? Um, so that's complicated. Uh, <laughs> um, that's also bacterial. Um, and so that's really far outside of my area of expertise. So I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, gosh, I hope so. Um, so. So epidemiologists are definitely looking at things from wild type virus. Um, we're looking at ways to break the machinery. And so what we're trying to do is really uh, not so much change the error rate of, of the machinery in wild type virus, but provide a drug that might be able to do that. So you know, we can't make a mutation in virus and then release it, because that would be all kinds of bad. Um, but what we, hopefully what we learn can make a drug to change how we would respond to a coronavirus outbreak. Does that more or less answer your question? Um, so the, what do you mean? Right, so mutation definitely is a balance, and coronaviruses and all viruses are actually tuned to their fidelity. Um, so it's been found that if you take a virus and you either make replication more faithful, so you make fewer errors, or you make the, the replication less faithful, so you make more errors, in either case, you lose pathogenicity. Um, and so really tweaking it in either direction um, is sufficient to uh, reduce disease burden. without creating some kind of super mutator Frankenstein virus. <laughs> yeah? Uh, this is more of a policy question. I, I will do my be best. Again, <laughs> but, uh, what do you think should be done? I mean, I think this is the first wave of an epidemic where we've had this problem, people that you know refuse to comply with any of the basic health requisites, including vaccines and are convinced that they're actually counterproductive? Um, that, is a, that is a very challenging policy question. Um, you know, to, to answer that, I'd really look across the globe. Um, and so we have cases uh, like China, which have incredibly strict quarantine, uh, quarantine measures. Um, they were originally very successful in shutting down COVID uh, at the strong expense of personal freedom. Um, that I don't think you'd, you'd ever be able to implement that strategy in the United States. Having said that, with the new variants, and, and even with those policies, China now still struggles with COVID burden. Um, and so that's not a foolproof strategy uh, to, to mandate those public health measures. In terms of vaccine mandates, uh, vaccine mandates are actually not that uncommon in the United States. Um, for anybody who sent their kids to daycare or, or school, it's not uncommon that you have to vaccinate your kids before you send them. Um, and so it's a bit of an odd issue that this came up for COVID. Um, but, but yes, that's, that's largely policy and pop culture and people saying things on TV that maybe they shouldn't. Um, but, but yes, I, I, I think that we should listen to public health experts when they say get vaccinated or if you're, home, if you're sick, stay home um, or get tested if, you're, if you think you might be exposed. Um, that's all good advice, um, and I, I think that we should do our best. Um, enforcing that is, a, is definitely more of a, a policy issue that I'm not qualified to answer. <laughs> yeah? The, uh, the difference between, I mean, one of the things I had seen is the, the, uh, Delta, vi the Delta virus is more uh, uh, pathogenic and, uh, initially, and then uh, Omicron came, but they weren't. They're not connected to each other. It didn't seem like they evolved from one to the other. And this Omicron is much closer, well, it seemed to derive directly from the alpha with, a, with 50 different yeah. mutations. Does anybody have any sense about why that occurred or where that occurred? Yeah, so uh, Omicron is thought to have derived from beta. Um, and it's the first instances of report for, of, of Omicron uh, I believe we're in South Africa, where, which had a much uh, stronger prevalence of beta. Beta never really took off in the United States. 
Um, the, the anecdotal story that I heard, and I don't know that this has actually been confirmed, uh, is that there was a patient living with long COVID and that provided the opportunity for that virus to evolve in the presence of an immune response, uh, which is probably why you see so many mutations in spike, is that you know, the, the, the host makes an antibody response, the virus mutates to escape it, and then the host adjusts its, its antibody response and the virus mutates again. So that's probably why we accumulated so many mutations for Omicron and why it looks a little bit like beta. Um, certainly there's mutations in Delta that Omicron doesn't have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Has anybody studied, um, you talked about the virus having to exit the cell. Has anybody studied how to stop the exiting? Yeah, uh, exiting is a challenge. So the, the actual release of virus is all me mediated by host machinery. Um, so that's a challenge. You could probably do something to inhibit viral assembly. Um, so how you actually form viruses to be uh, exported. I would say that viral uh, assembly is one of the more understudied aspects of coronavirus biology. Um, certainly, I think across the board, um, across viruses, it's not a well, it's not as well studied as it probably should be. Um, certainly for the enveloped viruses. We know a lot more for the, the capsid enclosed viruses and how those assemble. Um, but the, the enveloped viruses have been a much bigger challenge. It's, there's biochemical reasons for that. Um, the, the proteins that actually mediate the assembly are very hard to work with uh, in a test tube. Yeah? Do you happen to have any sense about the differences between how different, the, the diff two different mRNA uh, vaccines and how they operate? Would they operate in slightly different ways? Or e even the Johnson & Johnson or some of the others, they, they use a, a denosine virus, right. et cetera. But uh, so there are some differences uh, in, in the mRNA technology and in how that mRNA is delivered. Um, they do elicit slightly different immune responses. There was actually some papers out on that today um, in terms of what type of antibody responses and what type of, of effector cells get engaged. Um, they both really good at providing protection. Um, and so while the responses are different, whether those are really meaningful differences, I, I'm not certain of. Johnson Johnson is really different uh, because it uses an adenovirus uh, uh, vector as opposed to an mRNA vector. Um, so that's going to be a very different sort of, of response. Um, it's also one shot instead of two, so your response is generally lower. Um, but, but yeah. Can people hear me? Oh, oh, never mind. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> influenza viruses because they're not in the separate pieces. Um, but do they yeah. occasionally, right. essentially cross-pollinate? Yeah. So the question is, is do viruses have sex? Um, <laughs> That's one way. To yeah. This is, well, it's, it's yeah. how I see it. Um, so, so influenza uses a process of reassortment where it shuffles gene segments. That's very easy to do. Uh, coronaviruses are, uh, I like to call them rampant recombiners. Um, and so polymerase has the ability to jump across genomes. So it'll start replicating genome one, reach a site, and then jump to genome two, and then finish replication. Um, so it is very good at, at swapping genome segments in co-infected cells. Um, so they do have that opportunity. It is, it is different from how influenza does it, um, but they definitely have that ability. Zoom. Uh, Two questions are related to um, vaccine duration. Uh, so what, what will be needed to make a vaccine that is longer lasting? That's a good question. Uh, it depends on how the virus changes. Um, and so you know, what we've seen so far and the data that, that so far the, that we have um, is really that the vaccines that we already have are good against the variants. Um, so it's not necessarily how the virus changes over time that's reducing vaccine effectiveness. Um, it's also a question of how much vaccine protection do we really need um, as, a, as a population to shut down the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, 
Um, and so we, we don't have the answers to that yet. Um, and vaccine technology is not usually predictive. Uh, it's very empirical. So you design a vaccine, you test it, you see how it goes. Um, these worked, that was great. We administer them. Um, it would be nice if we had longer, uh, high level immunity, but immunity is not dropping to zero generally, right? So we're maintaining some level of immunity. You're still protected against hospitalization and death, which I appreciate. Um, but, but how exactly uh, you improve a vaccine to have a longer lasting effect, that's it's not clear. Um, what, if any, mutations help shift the, the newer strains of newborn or airborne spread? <laughs> this is difficult, sorry. <laughs> um, so what, if any, mutations help shift the newer strains from airborne spread to more aerosol sp spread? Um, so we're actually going in the reverse. Uh, we're going from aerosol spread uh, and, and respiratory droplets into uh, the airborne form. Um, basically, you need a, a higher spike stability. Uh, so spikes are inherently unstable. You can't really dry out uh, membrane-enclosed viruses and still have them be active. Um, and so really, it just depends on the size of the droplet that the virus can survive in. Um, again, we know what mutations wind up occurring. Uh, but we don't always understand the impact of a specific mutation uh, to contribute to that. So uh, the short answer is we, we don't really know. All right, uh, if nobody has any other questions, thank you guys. Thank you.